Hey there, welcome to episode 125 of Mike's Collection. I'm Mike, and the part of my collection that I'm going to be talking about today is some Star Wars Black Series figures. Now, I actually didn't uh, sit down here and intend to do a video on Star Wars Black Series. I do have a lot of Black Series figures to show you. Uh, this video is going to cover 12 different figures. Uh, I'm going to probably go through them relatively quickly so this thing doesn't run too long. However, I did get some very cool stuff just in the last couple of days, um, and I kind of wanted to do those. So I've been talking about for a while, I wanted to do a Masters of the Universe Origins videos, which is one of my fastest growing collections right now. Part of the problem with that is every time I uh, sit down and think I'm going to do my Origins video now, I end up pre-ordering something else, and it or something else I ordered ships, and it's like, well, I might as well wait for that other thing to come, and then it's, well, I'll wait for that other figure to come, and they just kind of keep coming. So, uh, yeah, that video is going to end up probably being long because I've got a lot of different figures to show you, but I am going to hold off on that. But uh, I did just pick up this uh, land shark from the Masters of the Universe Origins figures the other day, which is this kind of like big, goofy vehicle that I'm pretty excited to open up. But I have to wait to uh, shoot the video there before I can open her up. So anyway, this will have to wait till another time. And also, just today, a couple of my Marvel Legends pre-orders came in that I'm pretty excited about too. So I considered doing a Marvel Legends video because I've got quite a few of them piled up to show you as well. But uh, same with uh, Origins. I've got another Marvel Legend or two on pre-order that, that have shipped. So I'm expecting them pretty soon. So I might as well save them and do a Marvel Legends video altogether. But today I got Quasar, which is uh, one I've been, really been looking forward to, and also a new She-Hulk figure. So both pretty cool. So I'm eager to talk to you about all of them, and I'm eager to open them up and take a look at them. But that will have to wait. Today I'm going with Star Wars Black Series, because like I said, I've got 12 of them here that I've accumulated over the last mm, two, two and a half months or so. So some of these might not be super new because um, they've been out for months. And some of the figures are, are actually re-releases of figures that were available maybe even a couple of years ago. So it might not be the most groundbreaking new stuff that you've ever seen. But I do have some figures that are pretty hot off the presses too that I just got uh, last week. Um, so yeah, lots of stuff covering all the different eras. I've got some original trilogy characters here, some uh, prequel trilogy, Clone Wars, Mandalorian, I think. So yeah, lots of stuff. So uh, because I've got a lot of characters, I don't want to waste too much time here in the intro. So let's just uh, dive into it and take a look at my new Star Wars Black Series figures. So first up, we've got a Tusken Raider, or a Sand Person, as they used to be known. Um, like back when Star Wars toys first came out when I was a kid, a lot of these characters did not have... Uh, names sorted out that's why on the packaging a lot of them had names like walrus man and hammerhead and this guy here was sand person or sand people but over the years they kind of uh, elaborated on a lot of the naming conventions and walrus man is now ponda baba and hammerhead is now moma nadon and these guys are tuscan raiders and i can't actually remember they might have even referred to them that referred to them as that in the original star wars movie but uh I know they also referred to them as sand people in that movie for sure, and uh, that's what the packaging said. So yeah, these guys are from the original trilogy, uh, specifically the very first movie. These guys live on Tatooine, which is like Luke Skywalker's planet that he grew up on. So they're there for the first kind of act of the movie before Luke kind of goes on his journey. And uh, I'm kind of surprised they didn't reappear actually in uh, Return of the Jedi. But uh, because they go back to Tatooine for like the first act of that movie too, but we don't see these guys. Um, however, we do see them uh, pretty much any other time we go back to Tatooine. Uh, in Phantom Menace, they're there. In Attack of the Clones, they're there. And sometimes it's just something as simple like during the pod race in Phantom Menace, the pod race is zipping by and these guys like take a little shot at one of the pod racers and that's it. And then most recently they appeared... Um, Probably their best appearance yet, like they're mo it expanded on the characters the most in the uh, the Mandalorian recently. So yeah, these guys have been around a long time, and yeah, this is a pretty cool figure. Let's take a look at him. So you see his face is very detailed. It's all wrapped in bandages. He's got these crazy 
eyes and this crazy mouth and all these weird little protrusions everywhere. And I don't know, I don't think, it's ever really been stated what these guys are underneath the wrappings. Like when I was a kid, I thought for sure these are aliens and this is, I thought that was like their mouth and maybe these were their eyes. But I think it's clear, no matter what they are, you know, they've wrapped themselves up to protect themselves from the heat. But this probably allows them to breathe with the sandy air. And this probably allows them to see long distances and all this stuff. So this probably is not part of their biology. So maybe they're just regular humans under there, which is kind of a kind of a letdown. It's kind of underwhelming. But they might be like, uh, you know, green-skinned weirdos or something. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, lots of nice detail on the face. Lots of nice detail here with all the pouches. Pouches here as well. Now you can see this guy's got some soft goods. So he's a mix of uh, kind of soft, pliable plastic. And then the uh, soft goods cape here as well with the material. Now for weapons, he's got the uh, rifle that we've seen in the movies. This is what they were taking shots at the pod racers with. He's got his... Uh, these things have a name. It's a stick of some sort. I can't remember what it's called. But we saw him like picking his teeth with it in the uh, Mandalorian. But this is from that first early scene. When we first see these guys and he attacks Luke. You know, and they raise it up and... <laughs> you know, so there's uh, there's that. So of course he comes with those pieces. Now he also came with these three little... Uh, I don't know. Like arrows. Different types of kind of like arrowheads. But there's no point really there. So they're more like darts. So I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with these. Like there's, is there there's maybe a little hole at the end of his gun? Maybe he's supposed to shoot these out of the gun. I actually haven't tried this before until right now. Uh, I don't, nope, doesn't go in there. And I don't think he has anywhere to store them. So you see if we lift his, uh, his jacket up here. So he's got sculpted detail with straps and everything on the back. But I don't think there's anywhere to store those things. So yeah, they're just, you know, it's great, I guess, that they decide to include these extra pieces. And maybe there's some hardcore Star Wars fan that really wanted these included. But uh, they're going to go immediately in my spare parts bin and I'll never see them again. But yeah, I'll definitely display him with these other two weapons. So as far as the articulation goes, it's pretty standard Black Series stuff. You see he's got the double, uh, double jointed knees there. So there should be a good range of movement. But the skirt, even though it floats forward and backwards, so you can get to his legs, it does kind of hinder his movement a little bit. It's hard to put him in anything too dynamic as far as posing goes. But the articulation is nice. He's got the, uh, the rocker joint ankles, so it'll allow you to, you know, pose him. And he's got a good solid base, even with a wide stance like that. So yeah, a solid figure. I had the original one when I was a kid. I liked it a lot. It wasn't nearly as dynamic. Of course, because none of those figures moved very well. They only hit five points of articulation. Um, I don't have too many of my vintage Star Wars figures anymore. I've got a handful of them. Now, I do have a huge bucket full of, like, 90s era Star Wars figures. And so I thought I would dig out my uh, Tusken Raider from that line for comparison. And to my surprise, I couldn't find the standard figure. I might have gotten rid of them at some point. Which seems unlikely, because I always liked these guys. But there was a time when I was trying to purge my collection a little bit and I didn't want to keep, you know, 20, 30 versions of one guy. So I got rid of some of my various, uh, especially when it comes to Phantom Menace figures, because I had a whole lot of them. So I had a couple of Qui-Gons and stuff and I got rid of some of them. So uh, where the Tusken Raiders are not one character and they're kind of a, like an army builder, I don't think I would have gotten rid of one. So I don't know, maybe I've just misplaced them. But the only one I could find from my collection is this guy here. And this was not the standard figure that came, like, single-carded. This guy here, if you'll notice, he's got a, a particularly wide stance. And he's got knees, which was rare for figures at that time. See, because he still doesn't have elbows. Most of them didn't have knees either. But uh, these guys here, the, the sand people ride these hairy elephant things. Bantha. So, if you only know these guys from The Mandalorian... You would have seen these things here, but they were riding these things way back in the original movie. So this guy here with the bent knees, he's intended to be able to ride this thing. It's been a while since I put him on here. 
But there you go. So that's pretty cool. Like, I like this Bantha figure. I always like the Star Wars, like, beasts. Now, this is probably very unlikely to get made in the Black Series 6-inch scale. And even if they did make it, I don't know if I would buy it because it would probably be over 100 bucks. And it's not exactly the most dynamic of creatures. Um, like, I bought the Dewback, which is a big lizard. And I bought Jabba because he's one of my favorite characters. But yeah, I don't know if I would buy the Bantha. Who knows? But just out of curiosity, I doubt this guy will be able to sit on there because of the skirt pieces. And it sort of works. Sort of. Barely. He's popping up there. So there we go. There's my sand. There was my sand person riding a baby Bantha. So yeah, it didn't quite work out. I'm sure if I spent a little bit more time, I could figure out how to get him on there. But anyway, that's kind of fun, I guess. So there you go. There's the Tuscan Raider. Now this next one I'm really excited about. This is the Gamorrean Guard. So we first would have seen these guys in Return of the Jedi in the first act when uh, Luke shows up at Jabba's palace to rescue Han Solo, who has been frozen in carbonite. And these guys are kind of manning the door and uh, one of them ends up falling down into the Rancor pit with Luke Skywalker. And I absolutely loved these guys when I was a kid. The Gamorrean Guard was one of my favorite Star Wars characters. And even though he didn't speak English or really do all that much in the movie, for me it was more about how cool the alien was and how cool the toy was. That's why uh, like my favorite Star Wars character to this day is Walrus Man, who does next to nothing in the movie, doesn't speak English, but I just loved the figure and I loved playing with him. And when I played with my toys, he was always the hero. And similarly, the Gamorrean Guard always had a much bigger starring role in my childhood playtime than they did in the movie. So I have a real attachment to these guys. So yeah, great sculpted detail on this dude. Nice paintwork as well. Lots of different colors there. Some light brown around the eye, some darker brown on the nose and the lips. Some nice sculpting here on his tunic and there's some nice silver like reflective metal pieces there which is really cool and like the sand person he's got some soft goods too but rather than like cloth this is like a fur piece so he's got a sculpted kind of you know bathing suit under there but it looks cool with the uh with the fur like it works pretty well then he's got his sculpted feet and sandals and everything all very cool like this guy a lot and probably the coolest thing about this guy is his mouth opens. So, there you go. You can have him yelling as he runs into battle, or you can have him screaming as the Rancor is about to eat him. But, uh, yeah, really cool feature. You know, I like that a lot. The helmet almost looks like it's removable, but I don't believe it is. And I'm not going to try. Now, for accessories, he's got a couple of axes. So, this one's really cool. That's kind of a standard axe that you would see, you know, any old lumberjack walking around with. But this one's a little more hardcore, a little more medieval looking. So that's how I will probably display him. But he did also come with this weapon here. So this big staff, which is pretty cool as well. Now, as far as Gamorrean Guard goes for other figures. So I still have my childhood Gamorrean Guard. So... I still think this holds up as a very good figure. So that's the one I had when I was a kid. I've actually acquired another one since, and the one that I bought off a buddy of mine, he actually still has his axe. So that's pretty cool that I've got two of them. And then when it comes to those figures that I was buying up in the 90s, I think this figure is actually really awesome too, even though it's from, you know, 1997 or so. So it's pretty ancient at this point as well. I still consider it like a newer figure just because it's newer than those. But uh, you can see this one's got a lot more detailed sculpting. It's probably a lot truer, you know, as far as the face goes to what the character looks like on screen. And it's a lot closer to what we got here. So that's really cool. And another one I have, also in the three and three quarter inch line. Uh, this one came in a box set with the Rancor and stuff. But this, they tried to do the furry shorts in the small scale. And I do not think it was very successful. This guy looks like... Well, I think he looks ridiculous, actually. So he's got the same two axes and everything. 
And I think he must have had a helmet, which is removable, and it just must have fallen off, fallen off of him here. Um, but yeah, look at those those furry shorts. He just looks like a big. I want to say a Timbit, which is just a, that's a donut hole from Tim Hortons. I don't know if you guys have Tim Hortons where you are, but I'm Canadian and they're everywhere. And not that Tim, not that don't, not that Timbits are furry or anything, but he just looks like a big round ball. Is essentially what I'm saying. And he doesn't look very menacing. I think it looks pretty stupid. But it looks much better on this new Black Series figure. And uh, this is actually a figure some of you could have had for years. Because this came out uh, a few years ago. And it was a Target exclusive. There are no Targets in my province at all. Uh, so there was really no way for me to get them. Even when I searched eBay, right away he was being sold for two or three times as much. And he was already a little bit more expensive. He was called a deluxe figure just because he had... I guess because he's a little bit bigger in size and he had so many weapons. So I didn't really want to shell out the, the big bucks on eBay. I kind of kept holding out hope that maybe there'd be another opportunity to get him somewhere down the road. And sure enough, there was. Eventually, I don't know, the exclusivity with Target passed and he was available from other retailers and I was able to get him on Big Bad Toy Store. So yeah, I've had him for a while now. He's been sitting around here. But uh, yeah, this is a great figure. It's probably one of my favorite Black Series figures now. And so yeah, really cool stuff with the Gamorrean Guard. So next up, we've got Darth Maul. Now this is one of the brand new ones. This guy just came out like last week. You know, I'm in Canada, so I get things a little bit slower. But uh, even still, if you were in the States or something, you might have got this thing like two weeks ago at most. So this is a pretty new figure. So I'm pretty excited to have him in my hands and to be reviewing him. And I don't know if I even mentioned it with uh, the Sand Person or the Tusken Raider figure. So that was released uh, quite some time ago, maybe even a couple of years ago. And I had passed on it because at the time, and even now, I'm still not trying to collect Black Series. Like, I'm not a completist. I don't want to buy all the boring characters. I don't want to buy human characters generally. I try and stick to the cool robots and monsters, mostly because I have such a large three and three quarter inch Star Wars collection. And the sand person, even though he's a cool alien, it just, he didn't excite me enough. And I was like, you know what? I've got some of these guys in the three and three quarter inch. At least at the time, I thought I had a few of them. But as it turns out, I might only have one. So I passed on him. Now, uh, then they appeared in the Mandalorian. And it was kind of cool to see them again. And it kind of made me think, ah, you know what? I kind of wish I bought him. And so fortunately, they brought him back out. They re-released him as part of their, like, uh, what's called the 50th anniversary line or something. So new packaging. And uh, so I was able to get the sand person, which was cool. And same as that Gamorrean Guard. He was released a while ago at Target. Came out again uh, sometime later. But this guy here, brand new, hot off the presses. Now, the Black Series has been around for, I don't know, I'm going to say maybe seven, eight years now. And uh, no, they didn't wait that long to give us a Darth Maul figure. They actually released Darth Maul in the very first series of Black Series. And uh, I've got that figure right here. And this guy is pretty cool. I really like this figure. And he, he kind of had the option to have two looks. So here you see him with his, you know, his head showing and all that stuff. But there was a, you could pop this head off. And there was another head that you could put on here that had the cloak. And in the full, uh, so it was the hood and the full cloak that came down over top of him. And that was a really cool look too. But I, out of the two, I opted to display him like this. But now that I have this version, who doesn't have the option to have a hood or a cloak, I might actually change the way this guy is displayed and put the cloak on him. So, uh, yeah, interesting thing about this guy. Darth Maul is one of my favorite Star Wars characters. I absolutely love the look of him. And when Black Series first launched, I decided I'm not going to buy this line because I have so many little ones. Now, this Darth Maul figure is kind of what started me down the path because even though I said I wasn't going to buy them, I saw him in stores, I passed on him, but my brother Doug bought him for me for Christmas so once I got him and I opened him up and I realized how cool he was then I was like okay I guess I'm gonna buy some of these figures and I was really glad he got him for me because he quickly went up in value quite substantially uh, as the black series caught on and got more popular he became really hard to find and he was selling on eBay for like 150 bucks and at the time you know he was a $25 figure to buy and so yeah he shot up in value however they have since re-released this figure a while back as part of their anniversary collection. So I imagine the demand has died down some. So yeah, that still holds up. I think it's still a great figure. But this guy here is just really cool. 
Like, it's not the standard look you're probably used to with Darth Maul, because he was really only in, you know, the one movie. You know, he made a big impression in Phantom Menace, but then he died at the end of it. Sorry, spoiler. Um, then he did come back for a very brief appearance in Solo, just as like a hologram. And that's when we learned that he was still alive. At least that's when mainstream moviegoers learned that he was still alive. Um, I only really care about the live action stuff, but uh, if you do watch the cartoons, it had been established in Clone Wars that uh, Darth Maul had survived being chopped in two, and he now had mechanical legs. And yeah, he had survived, and now he was badder than ever. So this figure here, I think it's based on one of his uh, comic book series looks. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I really like this shirtless look for Darth Maul. And you get to see how intense these uh, tribal tattoos that he has all over his body. Really cool stuff. And look at that face sculpt. He looks angry, which is cool. Because like I like this face sculpt. Like It looks scary, and he looks like in, he's staring intensely at you. But it's, you know, it's different angry than what we got here. Now he's like burying his teeth. This one looks like he's going to fuck you up right here. So I, I like both of these quite a bit. And it was a relief to get a Darth Maul that looked badass. Because I loved this character from when he was first introduced in The Phantom Menace. And I had some of the uh, three and three quarter inch figures. But they never really lived up to my expectations. So for example, here is the first... Darth Maul figure that came out. Now, he looks intense, but he looks intense in like a crazy way. Like his eyes seem to be staring in different directions. His lips are just kind of pursed. He doesn't really look mad. Plus his arms are kind of stuck in his awkward position here. They were done that way so he could hold his two-sided lightsaber, but it's just like his hands are kind of stuck awkwardly. Not a great, not a great figure. And then there was this one with the cloth cape. This one's a little better. The face is somewhat similar to this guy here. But uh, just maybe because it's so small, it kind of lacks the, in the intensity. And he's also kind of weird. He's sculpted with knees, kind of like that sand person was, because this one was supposed to be able to sit on his little vehicle. So his arms are kind of stuck in a kind of a weird position, too, so he can hold on to the handlebars. And the soft goods cape is cool and all, but, like, it doesn't sit on his head very, very well. You can't really get that good look. So that's why I really like with that figure there, you had the option to have this sculpted plastic cape because that way the hood looked really cool. And another Darth Maul I have in my collection is, this is from back when the Phantom Menace first came out. So this figure was probably came out around 99. This is the 12 inch Darth Maul. Lots of nice different textures in his costume. But as cool as the and layered as this body was, here's the head. And I just found this head very underwhelming. Like he looks like he's saying, huh? Like that's not an intense stare, that's not a scowl. He's kind of showing his teeth, but you know, like it's not it's not by any means a scowl. It looks like he's uh maybe trying to pose for a photograph, but he's not very good at smiling or something. I just uh this figure, you know, I like the way the, clo the clothes hang everything. I like the way you, you, the hood comes up and it does kind of fit him pretty good in some positions. But yeah, that head was always just so disappointing. So for years, I had nothing but disappointing Darth Mauls. So now I've got two really cool Darth Mauls. And I like them a lot. So yeah, I don't think I need to go into all the detail about the articulation and whatnot. It's got the single jointed elbow, double jointed knee. The soft goods here, well, it's not soft good. It's like pliable, soft plastic, but it doesn't really get in the way of his posing. You can get some good poses and kicks and splits and everything like that out of him. So pretty cool, but just a great sculpt, great paint job. Love this guy. Now we'll probably move a little quicker through all the other figures that I have to show you because other than those first three we looked at, these are all characters that are brand new to me. Uh, I don't have any previous versions of them in the three and three quarter inch scale or in the six inch scale. For a lot of them, this is their very first action figure. So this here, um, this is a chick from the Clone Wars and I don't really know how to pronounce her name. I always say Aja Ventress, 
but her first name is A-S-A-J-J. So I don't know if Aja really works. And uh, I know they uttered her name out loud on the cartoons, but I haven't watched them in so long that uh, I don't really remember. But anyway, so yeah, this was like kind of an assassin or something that was working for Count Dooku. And she was originally introduced in the Clone Wars cartoon that took place between the, uh, I think it was between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Now, those cartoons, I'm talking about the 2D, uh, they were like animated shorts. And I thought they were really cool. They were very stylized and very fun. Um, and they kind of filled in the gaps on what happened during the Clone Wars. But from what I understand, those cartoons have kind of been retconned out of continuity. Like when uh, Disney bought Star Wars, when they bought Lucasfilm, they took a lot of the existing Star Wars media that wasn't the movies and said that doesn't exist anymore. And I know that really pissed some fans off. I didn't really care because I didn't read or watch most of the other Star Wars stuff. Like we're mostly talking about novels and comic books. So all that stuff was kind of kicked out of the main Star Wars continuity. So when they kicked out the Clone Wars cartoon, Aja Ventress was no longer a character in Star Wars. But uh, they brought her back. They reintroduced her in the CG animated Clone Wars cartoon. And so yeah, now she's part of Star Wars lore once again. And I don't remember what her whole deal was. Um, she wasn't really a Sith apprentice of Count Dooku. And I think the reason for that is because Dooku was an apprentice of Darth Sidious himself. So I don't think you can have an apprentice of an apprentice, but uh, she essentially was that. So yeah, this is a pretty cool figure. And she's relatively new. I've had her for, I don't know, maybe a month and a half or something. But uh, yeah, really nice sculpting and really nice, more so the paint. It's really nice paintwork on her face, like her eyes. This is not really a character I would necessarily describe as like a pretty character, but those eyes are beautiful. Really nicely done. And, uh, you know, I like that she's actually kind of short. Like, I don't know if that was established that the character was supposed to be short, but uh, it just feels a little more realistic when you've got characters of different sizes. And especially when you've got a female like this, it makes sense that she wouldn't be as tall as Darth Vader. So yeah, she's kind of petite, which I like. Uh, her outfit is cool. You know, for a uh, wannabe Sith apprentice, it's kind of a little flamboyant, I find. You know, Sith, uh, I think, usually prefer black, in my experience. But, uh, yeah, this is a pretty fabulous little glittery purple soft goods, like, uh, dress she's got on, or tunic, whatever you want to call that. Uh, so she's got wrappings on her arms. I don't know. The soft goods here, you can lift up the uh, the skirt, and you see that she's got kind of wrapped up like mummy like legs and then she's got this soft goods piece here which is also pretty pliable so again even with the soft goods you can get some really good splits and some good kicks and all that stuff so she's still quite poseable and yeah pretty cool figure for accessories she's got the double lightsabers with kind of this curved saber like handle which is kind of like what count dooku had so yeah, a pretty cool figure. I'm happy to add Aja Ventress to my Star Wars Black Series collection. So next up, we have a character called Carnor Jax. Now, when I shoot these videos, I don't really do uh, research. Um, you might be aware of that by how poorly I speak sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of ums and errs, and sometimes I even say things wrong when I'm kind of just talking quick, and then I'm editing my video, and I'm like, Oh crap, I called Darth Maul Darth Vader. So uh, yeah, lots of mistakes. And uh, anyway, I did do a little bit of research on some of these characters because I just needed something to be able to say about these guys. Because like I can pull out a Tusken Raider and a Gamorrean Guard and I can tell you about the first time I saw them in the movie and how I liked them as a kid. But when it comes to some of these new characters and some of these expanded universe characters, um, I don't really have much to say about them. So uh one thing I actually forgot to mention, but I thought was kind of neat when it comes to Aja Ventress, is I was kind of looking up a little bit of information about her, and I found out that her species is actually a Zabrak, and she comes from the planet Dathomir, same as Darth Maul. So I didn't, uh, I wouldn't have thought that Aja Ventress was the same species as Darth Maul, because you know Darth Maul has all the horns on his head and everything. So I don't know, maybe that's just 
something that the males of the species have. I didn't bother to research it that closely, but so yeah, I thought that was interesting to learn. And what I thought was interesting to learn about this guy is, uh, so even if you're just a casual Star, Star Wars fan, kind of like me, like I love Star Wars, but I love the movies. I don't really care so much about the books and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I do read the comics by Marvel, um, but for a long, long time, about 20 years, Dark Horse Comics was publishing all the Star Wars comics, and I never read any of those. Um, maybe it's just because I didn't read much Dark Horse in general, but uh, when they made the switch over to Marvel, I did get on board, and I've read most of what Marvel has published. So, you know, I do read some of the uh, stuff on the side. But anyway, this guy here, you might recognize him as one of the Royal Guardsmen who, uh, you know, stand loyally next to Emperor uh, Palpatine in Return of the Jedi. And these guys just stand very stoically on either side of the Emperor. Now, I actually have a Black Series figures of one of those Royal Guardsmen right here. So this is what they looked like in Return of the Jedi. You saw these cool sculpted helmets. And I don't even know if you saw their arms. I think you must have because I think they had these little sticks. But they have these big cloaks that cover up all their body. You didn't really see any detail. And, uh, you know, in the old figure from uh, the original Kenner line, you could lift their, their cloth and they just had these two big solid block legs. Like, it was, they were very stiff. Um, and then even into the 90s line, same thing. They were basically a big lump. They didn't even have separate legs. If you lifted their cloak up, it was just one big solid hunk of plastic. Um, so with this guy, when this guy came in a couple of years ago, it was pretty cool to kind of see what exactly is going on under there. And you're like, okay, this is, that's pretty crazy. He's got a whole, whole friggin' outfit under there that I wasn't aware of. Um, and yeah, he looks pretty cool. But still, these guys are kind of meant to just chill out, which is a shame because even as a kid, I thought these guys looked really cool, but it didn't seem like they did anything. Like they were just standing around doing nothing. Now, mind you, in the new trilogy, we kind of got a new version of the Royal Guard with the, uh, I think they're called Praetorian Guards. And I have a Black Series figure of them. And these guys were the elite guards for, uh, you know, what's-his-face? The new, the Emperor from the new movies. And that's when you actually get to see what a badass these Royal Guards or Praetorian Guards really are. These guys were like ninjas. So I imagine maybe that was the intent with these guys too. But we never saw it on screen in a movie. So, anyway, one of the comic book series that Dark Horse published was a series called Crimson Empire. And I remember when that came out, but I did not buy it. But I was definitely intrigued by it because it featured a royal guard looking like this, you know, looking badass with a weapon and doing stuff and kind of breaking free from just being this, you know, boring guard standing around. And I was like, oh, that's really cool because I like when they take, like, sideline characters that didn't have much to do and they really expand on them and make them compelling characters in their own right so uh yeah i knew all i knew about this guy carnor Jax, is that he was from crimson empire and uh, so i thought okay well let me just do a little bit of reading on him and yeah it turns out carnor Jax was he was a member of the royal guard he before that he was a stormtrooper uh after the emperor died uh so crimson empire took place after return of the jedi and he was kind of hoping to take the place of the Emperor. He killed the other Royal Guardsmen. So he does have a bit of a backstory. So that's what I would have found out to tell you. But the most interesting thing I found out about this figure while doing my background research is that this is not actually Karnor Jax. It was actually a mistake made by Hasbro. So this guy is actually another character from the Crimson Empire story called Kerr Kanos. And Kerr Kanos was actually the more heroic character who killed Karnor Jax. Sorry, spoiler alert. But, uh, so that's kind of funny that they mislabeled this guy. You know, like his packaging says Karnor Jax, um, but it's not. So this is actually Kerr Kanos. So, interesting. So I assume that means we'll probably get a Kanor Jax figure some point down the road, which I'm okay with, because from looking at the pictures when I was Googling him, this does look like the outfit that Kerr Kanos wears. And Karno Jacks wear something similar, except it's got like kind of black and everything here. So it's it's a, it's colored a little differently, and it looks pretty cool. So I would definitely welcome that guy into my collection as well. Let me get these guys out of here for a second. So 
yeah, I think his uh, the body sculpt on this guy looks like it might be the same as what we saw underneath the Royal Guard. Um, it's just now we see it because you know it's all its glory because the uh, the cloak is just more as a, a cape instead of a cloak. One thing that's kind of interesting about him, I think he has the same arms as the Royal Guard too. Now I wouldn't have noticed this on the Royal Guard because his arms are tucked away, but he seems to have really long arms. Like they almost come down to his knees. It's almost kind of gorilla like. I'm not I'm not a fan of the how long his arms are. It's kind of freaky looking. But depending on how you pose him, I guess you can kind of hide that fact. Um so you see he's got a weapon here, he's got this double bladed spear, which is kind of cool. He's also got a little pistol holstered here. Which now I'm curious. If my Royal Guard has one of those, I'm going to check right now. So let's see, Royal Guard. Oh, he does. Look at that. He's got a little holstered pistol as well. And yeah, you can definitely tell that this guy is the same figure underneath there all along. So I'm going to guess they probably knew they were going to make this guy for quite some time. The fact they went through the trouble of sculpting all of this underneath of the standard Royal Guard figure, even though you can't see any of it, they probably knew they were eventually going to go back and do this dude. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. He's got the double jointed knee there, rocker ankle, so you can get lots of poses, lots of movement out of this guy. And one thing that surprised me about this guy is I thought I knew what I was getting. Apparently, I didn't at all because it's not even the character I thought I was getting. But, you know, from what I saw of Crimson Empire, what I remembered about it, and what I saw when this guy was first put up for sale, is like, okay, he's a royal guard. He's got a red cape instead of a red cloak. Pretty standard stuff. But when I opened him up, I saw his cape. He's hiding this really fabulous purple shimmery cape inside of there. So, wow. You know, he is ready for Pride Month. And it makes me wonder, like, are these guys supposed to have purpley shimmery capes in there? Maybe they never made them that way because it was never really shown in the movies. But, uh, yeah, if that's what this guy has... Now, maybe he did that to stand out because he was trying to become the new emperor. but uh, Or maybe that's just what all these guys have underneath their cloaks, which is kind of funny to think about. So there you go. There is Kano Dex slash Kirkanos. Next up is Grand Admiral Thrawn. So this is another guy you might not be familiar with if you're not a big Star Wars, like, hardcore fan. Um... But this guy first appeared in a 1991 novel, which took place after Return of the Jedi. And this was another guy who was kind of trying to step into power after the Emperor had been killed and Darth Vader was you know, removed from the situation. So you've got this guy that comes up as the new Grand Admiral. Now, his books, including his origin, all got wiped out by Disney. However, like Age of Ventress, I guess they liked this character, they knew they had a fan base, so they reintroduced him, except he's a little displaced in time because he was reintroduced in the Rebels uh, CG animated cartoon, which takes place before the original Star Wars, rather than after Return of the Jedi. However, that uh, that amount of time is, you know, a couple of years or a couple of months, you know, the duration of the original trilogy, so it stands to reason that this guy would, you know, if he was around at the end of Jedi, he would have been around you know, before original Star Wars as well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if the stories have quite lined up. I think they did kind of, you know, shake around his origin a little bit and how that all worked out, but uh, I don't know. The only thing I know about this guy is I did read a four-issue miniseries that Marvel published, which I believed was sort of an adaptation of his origin novel. So I know, I know a little bit about this guy. And this was another figure that was released uh, a few years ago. And I saw it once. I'm having some weird lighting issues here. But anyway, so I saw this figure once and I passed on it. Because my rule with Black Series is that I want the cool aliens and the cool robots. Now this guy is an alien, as you can see with his blue skin. But this isn't what I would necessarily consider a cool alien. You know, he's not like Greedo, you know, or Hammerhead, something like that. This guy just looks like a blue dude. And I didn't know anything about him. I hadn't uh, I hadn't read the comic book or anything at that time. So when I saw this guy, I thought, well, I'll pass on him for now. Maybe I'll pick him up later. Um, but I never saw him again, so I was never able to pick him up. So 
after that, I read the comic book series and I thought, oh, this guy is pretty cool. And now I kind of regret not buying him. And he was getting kind of expensive on the secondary market. And I didn't think I'd ever get him. But then they re-released him as part of their anniversary line. And so, yeah, now here he is. So I think from the neck down, he's pretty much got the same, like, officer body that we've seen on Admiral Tarkin and some of the other guys. So nothing really new there for accessories. I think the only thing he had was his pistol, which is holstered on his belt. Um, I think he also suffers a little bit from his arms being a little bit long, but not a big deal. So the main thing to talk about with this guy is the head sculpt. You know, that's an original piece, and it looks good. You know, the, this was never portrayed by a... He was never portrayed by an actor, so there's no particular likeness they have to match up. But from what I've seen, as far as the drawings from the comic books and stuff, this looks pretty spot on. So, yeah, I dig it. So, yeah, not a whole lot more to say about Grand Admiral Thrawn, but it's a pretty cool figure. So next up, we've got Bo-Katan. So this is a Mandalorian warrior that was first introduced in the CG animated Clone Wars cartoon. Then that show went on hiatus for, I think, a couple of years. And during that time, she appeared on the Star Wars Rebels cartoon. And just recently, she found her way into live action for the first time in the Mandalorian series on Disney+. And what's kind of cool about that is the, uh, the actress... Katie Sackhoff, who voiced her in both the animated series, is the same actress that plays her in the live action. So that kind of stuff doesn't happen super often. So that's pretty cool as far as consistency goes for people that were big fans of the character on the cartoons. And I can't say that I am one of them. I didn't watch any of Rebels and with Clone Wars. I didn't watch any of the prior seasons. The only thing I watched was the most recent, like I think the final season, which was season eight. Um... And that was mostly because my younger brother was badgering me to watch it, saying, like, you gotta watch it, it ties in directly with, you know, Revenge of the Sith, it kind of happens at the exact same time, you're seeing things from different perspectives, and all that stuff, I was like, okay, I'll check that out. Um, and it was pretty good. So I did get to see Bo-Katan in action. So, since she is a Mandalorian, she has that very similar look. You know, it used to be very unique to Boba Fett. Um, however, it's kind of been driven into the ground at this point. Like, I still think the Mandalorian looks cool. And, like, if you've been paying attention to my Star Wars Black Series collection, I keep buying variations of the Stormtrooper over and over and over again. So I have a pretty big Stormtrooper collection. Um, so it's not like I'm opposed to them reusing the same mold, the same design. These guys are Mandalorian, so it makes sense that they would have similar suits. But I really just don't want to collect a whole bunch of them. You know, I grew up as a kid. The Stormtroopers were an army. There was a whole bunch of different Stormtroopers. You know, right in the, uh, you know, the first movie, you had the guys in the TIE Fighters. They were had the Black. And then in the second movie, you had the Snow Troopers. And then you had the Biker Scouts. So I was already sold on the idea of there being all kinds of different Stormtroopers and there being a whole bunch of them. But I grew up with Boba Fett being the only Mandalorian. So... It's a little weird now having so many different versions because I've got Django Fett and then I've got the Mandalorian himself in a couple of different outfits. And now we've got Bo-Katan and there's like a few other ones that are out that I don't have and there's more coming. So this design is getting a little played out to be honest, but I think Bo-Katan is a cool character. And uh, yeah, so there you go. Now, uh, I don't know for sure. I guess I could grab her and do a comparison, but I'm wondering if some of her body is reused from I don't even remember the character's name it was another female uh, from the I think it was from the Rebels cartoon and I don't believe she was Mandalorian but she wore Mandalorian armor so I don't know maybe this was borrowed from her as well but who really cares again it would make sense if they're both Mandalorians or they're both wearing Mandalorian armor they would have similar outfits so, for accessories, she's got two pistols, and they can be holstered in her belt. She's got a backpack, very similar to what we've seen with Boba Fett. That just kind of plugs in like so. And then the best thing about her is the removable helmet. Like, I think they've done a very good job of making the helmet look properly sized. Like, so often when they try and make removable helmets, the helmet looks really big and clunky. But I think this looks pretty much perfect as is. 
And I would have been fine with them saying, okay, well, you have to remove the head and you can put on unmasked head. That way we don't mess up the scale. But yeah, I'm really impressed that they're able to make a removable helmet and then have a head underneath that still seems appropriately scaled for the rest of the figure. So very good job on that, Hasbro designers. So there you go. This is Bo-Katan. She looks a lot like Katie Sackhoff. So again, good job there. Um, and I think a lot of that goes to the digital painting that they do now because there have been figures in the past where they probably are sculpted to look just like the actor, but then they just splotch paint on there and they give them googly eyes or something and it just comes out looking like shit. But with this here, you know, you get a good sculptor and then you get the uh, digital face printing on there and you really get a good likeness of the actor or actress. So that's what we get here with Bo-Katan. So yeah, she's pretty cool. So next up, we have the Shore Trooper. So this is another Storm Trooper variation, which I'm kind of addicted to collecting. And uh, what really sucked is I thought that Rogue One introduced some of the coolest Storm Trooper variations that we've seen in quite some time. Um, you know, even though the Clone Wars gives us lots of variations of the clones, and you know, they're pretty close to Stormtroopers. I just don't have that attachment to the clone troopers. Their armor just doesn't do it for me the same way a Stormtrooper does. And the revamp design from the sequel trilogy, you know, we got lots of variations um, with Captain Phasma and Captain Cardinal or whatever, uh, all these different colors and everything. But that design as well, even though it's very close to a classic Stormtrooper, it's just lacking something classic. Now with Rogue One, since it was set right around the same time as the original trilogy, I thought that the Stormtroopers they introduced in that fit in perfectly with the original trilogy Stormtroopers, and I absolutely loved the design of them. However, what was very frustrating is those figures were very hard to find. You could find kind of the main characters like Jin Erso and Cassian Andor all over the place, but as far as the troopers went, I like never saw them anywhere. So they released this character here, the Shore Trooper, when Rogue One was out in theaters, and I never saw it anywhere. Uh, they also released a, and actually, sorry, back then though, even though it was, I think it was labeled as Scarif Stormtrooper, because these characters were on the planet Scarif. So I think when it was first released, it was called Scarif Stormtrooper. And there was also a variant uh, called Scarif Stormtrooper Squad Leader, which I don't know if I realized there was two different figures at the time. The one I had seen around online was the squad leader, who I think is pretty much the exact same as this, except his paint job is a little different. He's got some blue added to his armor. And I really wanted that figure. I was looking everywhere for it. And I just couldn't find it. Um, so when I found out that the Shore Trooper was going to be re-released as part of the anniversary line recently, I was pretty excited to finally be able to get him. So I got him. My pre-order came in. I picked him up. And I was like, oh, where's the blue? I thought this guy was going to have some blue on him. And it was only then that I realized, no, this is a redo of the standard Shore Trooper slash Scarif Stormtrooper. It is not the squad leader. So I guess I'll probably never own that squad leader figure, or hopefully they decide to re-release him at some point down the road as well, because I really think that blue paint job kind of goes a long way to really make this figure look nice. Now, another thing that I thought was interesting is I'd been wanting this figure for a long time, I remember thinking it looked really cool, even though he probably shares parts with other Stormtrooper figures I have and everything. It was just something about this, like, helmet design, you know, the colors of him, even just these, you know, slight little changes really kind of made him look like a cool, unique character. Anyway, when I got him home and I realized, oh, I, like, already have that character. I had this figure already on my shelf, which I got him sometime after you know, the original release of these guys. But when this guy came out, he had a totally different name. He was called the At Act Driver. And so when I got him, I thought, okay, well, this is a character from Rogue One. You can tell from the aesthetic that he's a Rogue One trooper. But I didn't realize at the time that he was the exact same as the Shore Trooper. So I'm glad I got him. But it is kind of funny that I didn't realize that the figure that I really wanted, I basically already had on my shelf anyway. Anywho, these guys are both great, but I do think this guy's got the superior paint job. This guy kind of looks more like a toy next to him because this is much more gritty and it looks like he's kind of lived in in the real world. And it's just a really cool uh, look. 
so yeah and uh, yeah what do you want to say about these guys I don't know just good stuff very you know classic stormtrooper step you know the armor and everything like I said the pieces probably are borrowed a lot from other stormtroopers I doubt he's entirely new although I'm sure there's some new pieces in there but uh, yeah it's a really cool figure I like him so there you go the shore trooper next up we've got clone commander wolf now I don't know anything about this guy um, I just keep buying these stupid clone commanders um, like I said, I like getting Stormtrooper variations, but the clones, um, I, I don't really like buying them. If anything, I should probably prefer them because they're at least a little more unique. Um, they've got different paint jobs. You know, I've got a guy with red on them. I've got a guy with a like, green camo on them. I can't even remember all these guys' names. There's Rex and Greer and like, I don't know. I didn't watch any of the, of the Clone Wars where these guys were all kind of fleshed out. So I'm actually surprised that they keep finding new ones. I'm like, honestly, there's another guy called Wolf or another guy called Greer or whatever, like, I guess. So they keep making them and I keep buying them. And it's not a bad figure. Like uh, this guy here, you can see his face. He's got a unique face with the, the scar and he's lost an eye there. So that's something that took place in the uh, Clone Wars or the Rebels cartoon that I'm not aware of. You know, the face sculpt. You know, he looks a lot like, uh, I forget the actor's name, but the guy that played Jango Fett, which makes sense because he's a clone of him. As far as the armor, I'm sure it's borrowed from one of the other clone commanders. Maybe some pieces from the new Stormtrooper body that was recently uh, created. Um, but there might be some unique parts in here too, I'm not entirely sure. He's got some soft goods here. And yeah, my favorite bit here is the helmet. Because like with Bo-Katan... He's got a removable helmet, and I think it fits on there pretty nice and doesn't hinder, like it doesn't look weird. Like it doesn't have a big oversized helmet. I think that still fits him perfectly. Um, let me see. This thing here moves, as we learned from the Mandalorian, that this is like a little sight thing that Boba Fett uses or whatever to help him aim. So that's cool that that moves. The helmet's got a nice paint job on it. I guess, I don't know if some of this is just supposed to be dirt, I guess, but then he also has some custom paintwork on there, which I'm just noticing now is a wolf's head, which makes sense given his name is Commander Wolf. And yeah, I guess that logo there is supposed to be the same one here on his shoulder. I'll be honest, I haven't even really looked at this figure. I, I got him there a week or two ago and I opened him up and then I just put him on the floor waiting to review him. And yeah, I really haven't kind of fiddled around with him at all. So like that's kind of a weird design on this shoulder. Like the wolf makes sense to me. I'm not sure what's going on here. It almost looks like it could be like, a, you know, a bad Spider-Man logo or something. Anyway, I don't have a whole lot to say about these clone guys. He's decent, you know, but been there, done that. So speaking of clones, here is another one. So this is Crosshair. He is a member of the Bad Batch. Now the Bad Batch are pretty much exactly what it sounds like. They are a batch of clones that had some problems with them, some mutations. So they were considered, I don't know, a bad batch, I suppose. And they all kind of paired up and worked together. Although the name doesn't really seem appropriate because the mutations that these guys have are all enhanced abilities. So they're actually like the best of the clone troopers. So I guess bad batch is ironic. But uh, yeah, these guys were introduced in, I think it was season eight of the Clone Wars. Um, those, those few episodes that were leading up to the finale. And uh, now they have their own spinoff show. And, uh, yeah, I started watching it. Uh, I think I watched the first three, maybe four episodes. And I might go back at some point and watch the rest. But I just, I'm not excited about it. Um, these characters aren't really doing it for me. I'm buying them because they're kind of variations of Stormtroopers, again. But they do fall into that clone trooper more than Stormtrooper. And so, yeah, it just doesn't wow me. Um, their designs are at least unique in that they're this kind of gray black with the maroon kind of color however they all kind of look similar to one another so even though this guy looks unique from say you know wolf here he looks a lot like the other members of the bad batch i have two of them and there's two more on the way so crosshair he is like the team sniper the mutation that he's got is enhanced eyesight so that's why he's their sniper he's got a little pistol here on his belt buckle and then he's got this big huge sniper rifle 
that snaps into his backpack, which is pretty cool that it's got somewhere to store that. And then you can hold on to that thing, and it's a pretty big, pretty good sized gun. So design wise, I know it's probably pretty similar. He's probably got some shared parts with other clone troopers, you know, but uh, he's got this big backpack as well, which you can remove. And like the other guys, he's got a helmet. That thing goes down just like on Wolf. And this pops off. Ugh. And there's his head sculpt. Now, the head sculpt is pretty good. Like this guy, he's only appeared in the, uh, the CG animated shows. So the head seems a little off because I'm sure they could have made a head that looked just like the head from the show. But these Black Series figures aren't really based on the animation. They're supposed to be based in the live action. So it's kind of looks like they took a character that is very stylized and cartoony. And they, they kind of said, well, what would he look like if he was a real guy? If he was maybe had been portrayed by an actor. And so that's what we get here. So if you're like a hardcore fan of the show and you like that look, you might be thinking like, oh man, I don't know. I wish they didn't try and make him look more realistic because they could have done one that looked just like the show, but they didn't. Um, whereas me, uh, I'm kind of glad they went this route because I really don't want to add cartoony looking characters to my Black series. So I like that they went with the realism. And uh, yeah, I think it looks pretty good. And it still looks like the character from the show. Like it's easily recognizable as Crosshair. Now, rather than boot him out of the way, I'm just going to leave him there because we're going to take a look at his partner. This is Hunter, and he has heightened senses, so he's kind of a tracker. Um, so he's got a couple little guns here. Now, otherwise, I'm going to guess the body is probably similar with these two guys. Like, yeah, you see, like, they're uh, pretty much from the waist down. That looks to be all the same. The torso is probably the same, too. The shoulder pad. Shoulder pad's a little different. Uh, the arm, probably the same. Yeah, the shoulder pads are different. But I think otherwise, from the neck down, they're pretty much the same sculpt. This guy's got, you know, the extra kind of web gear here, the belt and all that stuff. So that kind of helps make them look a little bit different. The shoulder pads help, too, because he's got that, you know, extra piece coming off his. So, yeah, Hunter is probably the most boring of all these Bad Batch guys. The other guys that I have on pre-order but haven't arrived yet, one of them is a big muscular character, so he's going to have to have his own unique uh, sculpt. And the other guy is this kind of techie guy, and he's got all these little extra gadgets hanging off of him. So Hunter, even though he's kind of the leader of the team and probably the main character of the show, this is probably the most boring of the Bad Batch figures that we're going to get. So not much to say about him. He's got a backpack that comes off just like the other guy, and his helmet is removable. And there you go. Now, I'm wondering if this paint on his helmet is supposed to kind of represent his... Uh, I think that's war paint on there, but I don't know. Maybe it's a skin condition he has. But it kind of looks like he's painted it on his war paint. And so maybe he's representing that here on the helmet as well. But it's kind of hard not to see this guy as Rambo when you take his helmet off. And he's got that the long hair, the red headband. Yeah, it seems like Rambo. And that comes across a little comical to me which I don't think is what they're going for. This guy's supposed to be a badass. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I don't know. Maybe if the if I keep watching the show and it gets really good, maybe I'll develop a fondness for these guys. But right now, I'm not, uh, like, super smitten. And I should mention, too, he's got a, uh, a knife that holsters on there, too, because being Hunter, and he's a tracker, he's got to have a knife ready, too, for close combat. So there you go. There's Crosshair and Hunter. Now here is the last figure that we're going to look at in this video. This is an Elite Squad Trooper. So this guy is pretty new as well. Uh, he is part of the Bad Batch line of figures. And uh, when I pre-ordered him, I wasn't really sure what I was buying. Um, I hadn't watched any of the Bad Batch show yet, but I was familiar with the characters like Crosshair and Hunter from Clone Wars cartoon that they first appeared in. But with this guy... I pre-ordered him at the same time, and I was like, I don't know, I don't remember him. Was he in the show or in Clone Wars? I don't know. And I was like, what is he, just a black stormtrooper? Without taking a closer look at him, I thought, is he just the same as like the death troopers that appeared in uh, Rogue One? Anyway, now that I have him in hand, I can see that he is a clone trooper in black, really more in gray. 
and he's got this kind of green visor. So he's got a unique look to him. Although, you know, dark, like black colored stormtroopers are by no means as unique as they used to be. I feel like I have three or four black variations of stormtroopers now. So it's kind of hard to get excited about this guy. Um, although at least now I understand where they came from. I did watch the episode. I think it's probably only episode two, maybe episode three of the Bad Batch where these guys are introduced. Um, and here's a bit of a spoiler if you haven't watched it yet. But, you know, all the clones, they have to kill the Jedis, right? Because they get Order 66. Now, because of the mutation, most of the members of the Bad Batch don't... Uh, don't follow Order 66. They're able to uh, kind of fight against their, like, whatever, their inhibitor chip or their control chip. But Crosshair cannot. So Crosshair um, kind of becomes a bad guy and he kind of breaks away from the team. And so the uh, the Empire take Cross... Uh, what's his name? Crosshair here. And they give him a batch of elite squad troopers. These guys. So he's got four of them that are working for him as his direct kind of henchmen. And they go hunting the rest of the Bad Batch. I'm sure that'll probably get all worked out by the end of the season, but I haven't watched it yet. But uh, anyway, so that's what these guys are. These guys are working for Crosshair, helping him hunt down the other Bad Batch guys. So there were four of them. I don't know if they are going to be like unique characters. This particular toy didn't have a name, but maybe over the course of the season, you'll kind of learn who the Elite Squad troopers are, and they'll have unique personalities. But this guy here is just kind of meant to be a generic trooper. And I like the look. Like, I like that kind of matte black, that kind of gray. And the green visor. Um, it, it looks pretty cool. I like that that color. He looks uh, he looks pretty mean. But otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty sure his body, you know, from the neck down and, well, even from the neck up, it's all reused parts. It's really just the paint job that makes this guy stand out. He's got a blaster, which I'm sure we've seen before, too. Although I'm not exactly a blaster expert, but I'm going to guess that probably comes with the other clone troopers as well. Anyway, so yeah, there you go. That is the Elite Squad Trooper. Okay, so that is my latest Star Wars Black Series purchases. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, maybe leave me a comment below. I appreciate all that stuff. And uh, before I wrap up, I just want to maybe give a quick shout out to somebody who will never see it and doesn't watch this stuff. But um, if you've been watching my channel for a long time, one of my uh, very best buddies, uh, Andrew Vaughn, who was like a comedian uh, here locally in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, he passed away about a little more than a year ago now. It was uh, kind of the first month the pandemic really hit. Um, it wasn't COVID that got him, but it, it did suck because he passed away early during COVID when everybody was on lockdown. There couldn't be a funeral and we couldn't, you know, kind of get together and mourn him and all that stuff. And that's, that's been really tough on me this past year. Anyway, besides um, doing stand-up comedy in clubs and stuff, he also did a podcast with some of his comedian buddies, uh, Dan Hendrickin and Travis Lindsay. Uh, and those guys are both still alive and kicking, so I recommend you uh, you know, seek them out. I don't know. I think Travis has an album out. Um, I'm not sure if Dan does, but they're both funny guys. So, yeah, go check those guys out. They're probably on YouTube or maybe iTunes or something. I don't know. Anyway, my buddy Andrew, he did this podcast with them called the Boys Club Podcast. And uh, this was the uh, the logo to their podcast. Some microphones, some beer bottles, a skull, I don't know why. But uh, that was the logo that Andrew had designed. And uh, yeah, he had him and the other two guys had made t-shirts for themselves a while back. But uh, anyway, a few months after he passed... Um, or quite a few months, maybe almost a year or so after he passed, um, Dan had kind of reached out to some of his friends and said, um, yeah, I'm thinking of doing another run of these boys club shirts to raise some money to, uh, give to Andrew's family. And, uh, so yeah, I ordered one of these shirts. It took a little longer than I expected. I actually, I ordered it months ago. I sent him the money and I kind of forgot all about it. But anyway, it arrived in the mail this week. So it's, uh, it's nice to have this little memento of Andrew. Check out his comedy as well. He's got an album. I don't even know how you can listen to it. It might be on Spotify. It's called Too Fat to Go Kart. So yeah, if you're a comedy fan, uh, check out all three of those guys. Anyway, so thank you, Dan, for the shirt. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you back very soon with a uh, Marvel Legends video and with the Masters of the Universe, Masters of the Universe Origins video. 
and probably a bunch of other stuff too. So I'll see you then. Ciao.